I want to talk a little bit about, um, I'm going to talk a lot about what HathiTrust does around collections today and um, uh, in a couple of different ways. What we do with digital collections and what we hope we can accomplish uh, with our membership uh, around physical collections as well. These are not the only things that we could talk about with HathiTrust, but there are a couple of salient issues that I thought might be interesting for you all here today. So uh, very quickly to cover uh, an outline of what I'm going to be covering, I'm going to talk about some of the characteristics of our collection. I will first address, you know, what is this HathiTrust thing anyway? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a program we have to undertake copyright investigations and copyright review, and then I'll talk about a shared print program we have underway that is led by Lizanne Payne, our shared print program officer who's sitting right there in the turquoise jacket. Uh, let me get my timer on so I don't completely overstep my welcome. Uh, so first off, Hathi Trust, what, do, what are we? Um, a lot of folks will think of us first as a website, as a place on the web where one can go and access digital content, uh, historical legacy digital content, kind of like JSTOR, but not quite because there's not all that much stuff there, not all the same things. Um, I want to acknowledge that absolutely no attempt to invest this website, in this design with human emotions was made uh, <laughs> during, during the design phase of this particular iteration of the hot trust interface. Um, we're happy with it, but yet. Uh, the, um, the, I, I think it is important to acknowledge that yes, it's a digital library, but we think of ourselves as much more than that. We're very much an organization that is attempting to work deliberately above the level of our individual libraries uh, in order to accomplish some things that we could not do independently and individually. Uh, so our library, our mission is a library mission, but it's one at that higher network level. Um, our, our, um, uh, another way of thinking about what we do is we're trying to cooperatively develop a common good uh, a set of services and activities and collections that can be beneficial to the membership and help them bring more value to their own students and researchers, but also be beneficial beyond, beyond that. Uh, we are a trusted uh, digital repository in the sense that we have been through track audit and we do operate a, a preservation infrastructure. And in fact, that digital preservation infrastructure I think of as the base for all of the other programs that we undertake, which we, are, we think of as quite transformative. Uh, we're a membership organization as well. Uh, it's actually about 126 members right now. And our, our funding, with the exception of our research center uh, and some specific projects there, our funding is entirely uh, from, from member fees. This is a current uh, list of our members. I think it's important to acknowledge that while I'm talking about collections with a global reach, our membership does not look very global. It is very North American focused. Uh, it is, uh, 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 there are seven institutions outside of the United States, four in Canada, British Columbia, Calgary, Alberta, and McGill. Uh, we have Queensland University from Australia, uh, uh, Universidad Complutense de Madrid, and uh, American University of Beirut are the non-US universities. And it's important to acknowledge this because a lot of what we do is based in US copyright law. Uh, and I think uh, one of the difficulties of collaborating internationally around libraries, library collections, and digital realm has to do with different copyright regimes, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as we go. So on the collection front, uh, the collection today includes about 15 million digitized volumes, right? So that could be uh, uh, multiple volumes related to a single title. If you go by our metadata, which is marked so your mileage may vary, that's about seven and a half million monographic titles and 415,000 serial titles. Of that, 38%, uh, 5.8 million volumes are open. And I was talking with Lizanne about this earlier this afternoon, and I, I cannot remember the exact number of titles that equates to, uh, but it's between two and three million, and I'm sorry, I, don't, I just couldn't keep that in my head with my, with my head cold. Uh, the the uh, materials in the collection are primarily digitized, almost entirely digitized from legacy collections. I think it's important for us to consider going forward how our collection becomes prospective as we really focus on bringing more uh, scholarship into an open access environment, which let's face it, is not always well integrated into workflows for libraries for discovery access and, and preservation as well. Um, we will be focusing primarily on book collections for the foreseeable future, although we, in the past we've been asked about other collections. Uh, that's really where our focus is going to be. Uh, a quick look at the linguistic uh, spread of our collection. It is about half in English. Uh, you see the top 10 languages there. It's very diverse linguistically. 
Uh, to pivot to usage for just a second, I can tell you that about 60% of our, of our sessions, over 10 million sessions last year, uh, were from English-speaking countries. Um, uh, and uh, with about half of those from the United States, uh, the United Kingdom is the second country that most frequently visits HathiTrust, uh, 6% of our, of our visits last year. Um, with Germany being in the top five as well. So it is a collection that's broadly beneficial to uh, individuals around the world, we, we, we believe, and we're happy about that. The collection is primarily from uh, uh, North American research libraries. I, I didn't get to this in my last section, uh, but the, really this, this organization came about in the wake of mass digitization. So if you look at the, the contributing libraries in the largest aggregate here, they are organizations that partnered with the Internet Archive or Microsoft or Google early in this century to begin mass digitization of collections. And, uh, and that, is, that was really the problem, if you will, that got us uh, focused on how to collaborate in a more uh, focused and intensive way. The, the uh, access protocols for our collection um, are often quite difficult for folks to understand, but I think I may have finally distilled it down to one slide. Uh, the, for anybody anywhere, any of you would be able to search the collection. You'd also be able to go to the Hathi Trust Research Center and do some basic text and data mining using some services they have there. And you could read uh, online any of the works that are open or public domain in the location you happen to be. Members have uh, more advanced access to the public domain materials. They can uh, download those works. Uh, the, uh, for members, we're able to provide services for their students and faculty who have print disabilities or are blind or otherwise have need for assistive technologies. We can make some collections available to those, to those individuals. And we do have, under library exceptions in the United States, uh, uh, replacement access, both in either print on demand or um, digital access for materials that have been lost or damaged or otherwise missing, not available. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll, I'll say just another quick word or two about, our, about this mode of access, our non-consumptive access, by which I mean simply access that's not primarily for reading, uh, access that's defined around computational analysis, uh, often sometimes called distant reading. Uh, this is, uh, the Hathi Trust Research Center is based at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign at Indiana University. Uh, the, the, the work that we do is distributed around our membership. We really depend upon distributed expertise and, 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 and effort to make this whole thing work. And those two institutions have particular expertise around text and data mining and infrastructure to support that. So they have been developing uh, scalable services that enable secure high-performance access, high-performance and virtual access to the entire Hathi Trust collection. Uh, one of the ingenious services that have been developed there is something we call the data capsule, which is really a virtual environment where you have access to some subsets defined by you of the Hathi Trust collection that you can then run your own analyses on. For the, this is available for the entire collection without regard to the status of its copyright. Uh, that is, uh, again, based in a fairly well now established principle in US law of, uh, of digitization for search and analysis being a fair use. Um, we do distribute data sets for individuals to work with on their own, but we can only do that with the public domain data. And just a very quick couple of examples of the kind of research that has been done at the research center. These are a couple of special uh, projects through a, uh, an advanced collaborative support program we offer. Matthew Wilkins has done work to pilot uh, the extraction of geographic place names from 10,000 volumes of the Hathi Dress Corpus, well on his way to working on that for the entire collection as well. Uh, Michelle Alexopoulos is an economic historian at the University of Toronto who has very interestingly done analysis on subject headings and library metadata to look at technology diffusion. So, you know, what, what technologies evolve in a particular domain and then over time diffuse and evolve and become, become apparent in other information domains. And her work now is focused on content analysis of, of full work. And um, you see a couple of visualizations of, of that there. So that's the collection, a little bit about our access policies, a little bit about some of the services we provide. Uh, I'll turn now to talk about one of the major programs we have underway that I think is, frankly, the best example I have of the kind of distributed cooperative work we've been able to do 
through HathiTrust, and it's a program of copyright review. Um, to get to the to talk about why we do this, I want to show a couple of pictures here. This graphic is an attempt to show uh, the distribution of works in HathiTrust by date of publication. The bars represent primarily decades, with the exception of a few of the far left hand, which represent centuries, because we just don't have that much from the 14th century in the collection right now. Uh, a couple of things I think are quite interesting looking at this. You can see the post-war boom in scholarly publication very clearly by looking at the, at the high boost on the right side of the graph. That's all post-war. Uh, you can also see that as the 20th century moves on and that explosion occurs, digital access is, decreases. Right? The orange, and the orange uh, lighter sections on this graph indicate material that is open or public domain and Hathi Trust. The dark indicates that which is not in full view, which is, is restricted. This graphic is another view of the collection, but focused more specifically on the different kind, the different status of uh, copyright status of works in the collection. Uh, the majority is in copyright, uh, where we, at least as far as we know, uh, there are there's a substantial portion that's not, and that is open for various reasons. Some material has been licensed by the rights holder uh, with uh, through us for full access using Creative Commons. Uh, a small portion, but actually a large number of volumes are in the 30, 40,000 volume, at least. Uh, the U.S. federal documents are not protected by copyright, so those are also fully open. Um, and about 19% of the collection is public beyond the docs and the Creative Commons is public domain outside of the U.S. and inside the U.S. That's the PD worldwide. Um, there's a portion that is only considered to be public domain in the U.S., and that is material for which we have not always been able to determine clearly whether or not uh, uh, it is in copyright outside of the United States. We, we have different copyright regimes here, I'm sure you're aware, than the United States. It's a hard date right now. Um, uh, after 1923, you can assume it's in copyright uh, from a particular date, which I forget, I think it's 7096, I can't remember. We do have life dates in the US, but for a large portion of the 20th century, it's 95 years. Um, with a few exceptions, which I'll talk about. But of course, it's life dates in the rest of the world. And so one of the challenges we have, um, my predecessor, John Wilkin, who John uh, cited earlier, had a great phrase called bibliographic indeterminacy, uh, meaning that the difficulty, the challenge we have in actually knowing uh, about our, know, knowing things about our collections based on the quality and the, the, the depth of the metadata we have about it. So this is what's led us to this uh, program of copyright review. And uh, this, is a, this is work that is focused on systematic distributed investigations into the, into the status of individual titles in Hathi Trust. Uh, we have had over the last eight years, uh, through the goodwill of our membership, over 100 individuals and libraries and probably 30 or 40 different libraries participating and contributing staff time towards investigating the status of these works. And the, the way the, pro, the program has worked is it's a, it's a double review. Two different individuals look at the same work, do the investigation, and then we'll, uh, if they agree, we will determine, you know, we'll assign a status to it. If it's, they determine it's public domain, we'll open it. If they, are, uh, if they say we can't figure it out, we'll mark it indetermined. Uh, if, they, if they disagree, we'll have an expert reviewer adjudicate that. The, the, the focus has been on two distinct pools of content uh, for different, because of different copyright regimes. In the US, we've looked at publications published after 23 and up to 1977, because during that time in the US, works had to be, uh, uh, meet certain formalities to be under copyright. They had to have the little C mark inside of them, and they had to be registered, and they had to be renewed. And if both of, either of those formalities were not met, by now they are out of copyright, right? So we're focusing on several, we focused on several hundred thousand volumes from the U.S. during that time period. Then we undertook a project to look at uh, publications uh, in the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. Those dates noted there uh, observe the 50 or 70 year rule of copyright, uh, life dates plus 70 or 50 in those, in those countries. And you can see here that as we've gone through this work, roughly half of what we have uh, looked at, we've determined to be in the public domain. Um, that does not mean the rest of it is certainly 
in, in copyright, uh, often we will not be able to make a determination and we will mark it such so that we can come back and do other work later. The reason sometimes we mark it undetermined might be um, we just don't have sufficient information, we can't find life dates, it might include photographs without credits and we can't determine the copyright status of those. So this is quite intensive looking, um, and it's, uh, but it's one that we focused and developed in a way that is focused on speed and scale. Uh, and again, this is about 650,000 works that have been reviewed in the course of eight years, um, twice, right? So this is, this is a pretty significant <coughs> contribution. And there's still more to be reviewed. There's some gaps in what we reviewed for the, um, what we called the World Project. We did not review materials published in New Zealand, South Africa, India. Um, I believe there are some materials published in the United Kingdom now that we have not gotten to as well. Our current project focuses back on U.S. We have about 100,000 volumes to review in the U.S. Do I have anything else to say about that? I think I will just move on then. Um, that's that's one, one major project. Again, the benefit is to individuals worldwide because we're opening these things worldwide. But um, uh, one of the things that opening materials worldwide does is it gives libraries an opportunity to think differently about how they manage physical collections. Um, you're probably fairly aware of this, right? After, after we started digitizing collections of journals in the 1990s uh, with JSTOR and individual publishers, and they began selling them back to us, uh, it gave us an opportunity to think about, well, do we need to retain these journal titles in our central uh, stacks? Could we move them to another facility? Uh, and then as the years wore on, we got more radical and thought, do we even need to hold on to these things or bind them anymore? Uh, and, uh, and so I want to talk about the shared print program we have underway because I think it's one that is, uh, it is just getting underway, has a great start underway, but it's really one that's focused on a prospective effort and one that I think has some interest, potentially some interest here in the United Kingdom. So the goal of this program um, is twofold. Um, the one I put on the slide is that we want to link preservation of the digital and physical. Right? We want to be able to tie those two things together so that our libraries can ensure that the print record goes forward. Um, another driver is that there are real problems of economics and space in almost all of your libraries and certainly in most of the libraries in the United States as well. Um, that bar graph that went bump on the second half of the 20th century was not accompanied by a bar graph that went bump on the amount of dollars available for library facilities to be built. Maybe in the 60s and maybe the 70s, but not into the 90s and, and into this century. So there's a real space issue. Um, and the goal, uh, one, another way of articulating the goal has been to help our members uh, uh, find ways of more efficiently and more effectively cooperatively steward these collections and do so in a way that saves them some capacity. So this project is not focused on serials, it's focused on monographs. Um, most of the work on shared print in the world has been focused on serials. It's not done, but we, we're, monographs are just getting underway. So the goal of this work is to establish a one-to-one -one physical mirrored collection of the Hathi Trust collection for monographs. So this would be physical copies retained by members. Um, it's distributed. The material will need to be lendable. That is, it will need to be accessible to other uh, partners in the program as well. It's a program that's really intended to be a benefit to the entire membership so that even if you're not a retaining library, you would be able to obtain access to the collection. Um, and this last point is very important, that we want to build on what's already going on in the realm of shared print and not disrupt that. In fact, if we tried to disrupt it, we'd not be successful and we would waste a lot of effort. So the, the goal is really trying to build on those existing resource sharing arrangements and not, uh, not break them down. And there are a lot of existing resource sharing arrangements in North America. Um, uh, we, there, it's, a big, it's a big country. Uh, there's, a, there's like 900, I think OCLC estimated 900 million holdings across North America and maybe 47 million distinct titles. This is several years ago, so those numbers may not be quite right any longer. Um, what you've seen is these regional alliances, these regional shared print programs around serials emerging. Uh, and they often build off of existing resource sharing networks for interlibrary loan or maybe licensing or other kinds of consortia. And um, often quite really large. East is notable in that it's relatively recent and that it is focused on monographs. And it's also quite large in, in that sense. So these are the programs that we feel we need to be able to work with. Um, what I think is notable about 
about this work that we have and see in the United States is as much activity as there has been, it has really been in the regional level, right? There's, there's been some effort to coordinate at a national level, but not uh, in a very, um, I don't want to say, it's not that it hasn't happened, it's not been in a, uh, as productive to do so. It's been more informal. There's not, uh, there's not like agreements between these programs. There's agreements between libraries and these programs. Uh, it's also difficult to connect these, these uh, different programs. They're, the data available is of varying quality. And this is like the story of library and the libraries and metadata, of course. Uh, but CRL has done a fair amount of work looking at the data that they have in their PAPR registry on serials um, commitments. And uh, what, what we have uh, there uh, is data of varying quality, difficult to make actionable decisions on. So in, uh, why is that? Well, one reason is that it's very hard. It's harder to disclose your retention commitments the higher up you go in this stack of, of networked um, sources. Uh, in fact, there's less incentive for you to do so because if you're a library and all you, really, you may only need to know or feel you need to know what's accessible to you and to your patrons. And if you're in a shared print network, you probably need to know what's accessible within that network. Um, but it's not necessarily the case that folks in another network need to know that. Right, because you're not retaining on their behalf. So the goal that we have is to take advantage of the fact that we collect holdings data from all of our members, physical holdings data, uh, which is reported annually, maybe biannually in the future, uh, to, to launch this program. So the goal here is look at this holdings data, consider its overlap with the Hathi Trust digital collection, and then use that analysis to drive the shared print program going forward. And I have just one last uh, slide here with uh, any content on it. This is a quick view of the implementation plan for this program. Uh, we often call phase one a quick launch, meaning we're moving fast to get some substantial work done initially and then analyze the results. So the goal is that by the end of this year, we will have matched about half of the collection and about half of the collection will be committed to be retained uh, for a period of perhaps 25 years by Hathi Trust member libraries. So we have a lot to do in the remainder of this year. We've got to develop, formalize our policies and the agreements to hold this uh, and get those commitments uh, disclosed. That's just getting underway right now. That the, the, the commitment analysis has been done. The libraries are now considering what they can commit to us. We're deferring a whole lot of important questions that would really move this from uh, 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 to a preservation conversation. Uh, but those are the questions that we can begin to look at in the second phase of this, which will begin next year where we try to, it really becomes a long tail question then, right? What can we, what are our gaps in our coverage? What do we need to get? Uh, we might have to do some closer looks at uh, particular library collections and make requests of specific materials to be held. That's all, all to be determined. Um, but the point I want to make here is that, you know, we need to find a way to get started. And our goal here is really to help catalyze that, that start through this program among our membership. And so I will leave this, I'm just about out of time, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, just a quick note, I, I, know very, I know very well I'm talking about a very particular context, a very particular context in the United States, um, and that the UK context is quite different. I'm eager to hear more about that and understand you know, what issues you face around shared print and questions you have about that. So I will take questions you have at this point. Thank you. Thank you.